Good evening and welcome to Special Assignment. I'm your host, Ashraf Garda. This year, South Africa celebrates 20 years of democracy. And on May the 7th, the country will hold another election as a sign of this maturing democracy. What does the attainment of democracy mean to South Africa, especially in relation to other countries in the region, such as in Swaziland, where opposition parties are still banned and activists find themselves exiled from the country of their birth? Should South Africans use their own freedom to promote freedom elsewhere on the continent? In tonight's episode, we put the spotlight on the struggle for political freedom in Swaziland through a documentary titled Swaziland and Dlamini Dynasty, produced by Zim Media. In 2011, Swaziland, famed guardian of African tradition, was forced to ask neighboring South Africa for a bailout. People were hungry. 63% of the population were living below the poverty line. Yet the king of Swaziland, Mswati III, was, and still is, one of the richest leaders in Africa. These gross inequalities are the result of a political system in crisis. For the last 40 years, a state of emergency has been used and political parties have been banned from functioning. In 1903, Swaziland became a British protectorate. Britain made few changes to traditional rule and in 1921, Sobuza II succeeded as Ingwenyama or leader of the Swazi people. Industry grew, and in towns and workplaces, political parties and trade unions developed. Sopuza saw these as unswazi, divisive elements brought by imperialists. By the early 60s, there was clear resistance to Sopuza's authoritarian style, which he claimed was traditional, as well as to British rule. Dr. Ambrose Zwani formed the Ngwani National Liberatory Congress, or NNLC, and under pressure, Britain agreed to grant Swaziland independence as a multi-party democracy. At independence in 1968, the new constitution granted Sobuza Swaziland's considerable mineral rights. He set up a trust fund called Tibiyo Tagangwani. Tibiyo paid no taxes, and was totally controlled by the king. In the same year, Sobuza had a new son, Makoseti Vedlamini. He was to become King Swati III. In 1972, Sobuza's party won 21 seats in parliament, while the NNLC won three. King Sobuza reacted strongly to any party political opposition. The king then abrogated the constitution. That is when he made uh, the infamous proclamation that he, King Sopuza II, has now got absolute power where all arms of government were vested in him. He banned all political parties, all meetings were banned, and he was the supreme. The NNLC leader was imprisoned without trial for almost two years. The entire civil liberties were actually absolved, removed from the people, and the state of emergency began to roll out. That day, an army was introduced. The labor rights were also muzzled. The media rights were also muzzled. That kind of era existed for more than three decades. And that created a culture of fear, a culture of being silenced, and, 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 and a culture where you could not express yourself freely without uh, looking around and see if there are no people listening and you could not end up 
in jail yourself. In 1973, Sopuza banned political parties and entrenched his control through the Tinkunda system. People feel intimidated by what the chiefs think or what want. Dibio held millions of dollars in trust for the nation, but few outside the royal family and their supporters saw any benefit. In 1982, Sobuza died. There was a lot of uh, power struggle as to who should take over power. But secretly, the present king had already been identified and sent to school in uh, Sherborne in the UK. The young crown prince was Makoseti Vedlamini. With no king on the throne, the Likoko seized power. Shocked at this fighting and corruption, university students formed the People's United Democratic Movement or Budemo. As unrest spread, the king was brought back, and in 1986, at just 18, Prince Makosetive was crowned King Swati III. Although my experience is short and I'm new to this task, I have in my predecessors an example I can follow with certainty and confidence. God bless you all. The honesty and humility of his installation speech gave people hope. He dissolved parliament and called for new elections. But by 1990, the country was no more accountable than before. Mswati used the economic and political structures set up by his father for his own benefit. The formation of Pudemo was a thorn in the flesh for the regime because we were saying that there must be a national dialogue towards a proper transition and a, a democratic society. Still to come, state violence increases amid growing dissent from the masses. In November 1990, students protested and were met with unprecedented police brutality. When we are citizens, we have no voices because political parties are banned. When we are workers, we have the voice because unions are allowed. And therefore, we decided deliberately as a labor movement that we are going to use the union as a vehicle for social transformation. Hence, we then began to roll out the famous and popular 27 demands. The demands were about creating a more democratic country. This led to an attempt on Sitola's life. I, I was stripped naked and I was stuck in the boot of my car. To me it was indeed an assassination attempt, but God willing, I did not uh, become uh, history. Strikes were followed by an eight-day stay away. People wanted change. Under pressure, Mswati decided to consult the people on a new constitution. By now, Tibio was taking half the shares in most foreign investments. There's a country on the African continent that today is making an important contribution to world trade. It is now practically a private piggy bank um, that is being used by the royalty and the institutions of the monarchy to basically contribute to the funding of the lifestyle of the monarchy. The majority of Swazis eke out a living farming small plots of land. But with no security of tenure, thousands of people, including chiefs, have been pushed off the land and now live in exile. 
and many small farmers, kept ignorant of any ideas about democracy by Mswati's control of the media, have been evicted from their lands to make way for royal sugar estates. When you speak to the people, you can feel that uh, the people are living under a poverty line, which uh, in many, many cases we feel we have to do something. And it's always very sad when you see a lot of them speak uh, about their lives, uh, how difficult it is, uh, how difficult they are coping, looking after their families and so on. Uh, and then you see sometimes that uh, you wish to help them, but uh, funds are always uh, not enough. Lies, lies said over and over with no challenge becomes truth. It's a tactic, it's a style that regimes historically till to date have in particular, dictatorial ones, have been very good at. At the hands of an oppressor, the best weapon is the mind of the oppressed. Is it, what is this thing? The king used TBO funds to bring people together, but many felt the tradition had been corrupted. It has become a place for recruitment. It has turned around to say, if you want to go to the police force or to, to, to the defense force or to, to, the, to be a prison warder, somehow you must participate in the writ dance. Following tradition, the king has 13 wives, but the tradition of multiple partners combined with poverty fueled a shocking HIV epidemic. Life expectancy dropped to 44. In 2005, a new constitution was finally signed. But the king's power remained unchanged. Anger grew. A bomb was placed under Lozita Bridge near the royal palace. The authorities imprisoned Pudemos Mario Masuku without trial for nearly a year before he was judged innocent and released. We went to welcome him at Central Prison in Matsapa and bitter the state was, dangerous the state was. Beating of us as activists for doing nothing, merely a welcoming our leader. You know, you begin to think that perhaps the army, more than protecting the state, is, is being used to actually put down any dissent internally. Next up, a call for mass mobilization in the struggle for a democratic Swaziland. As the drought-stricken troubled country plunged into debt, the king decided to buy a royal jet. In 2009, his personal fortune was around 
100 million US dollars and through Tibio, he was sole trustee for the Swazi nation, holding an estimated 10 billion US dollars in Saudi Arabia. And still, no taxes were being paid by the DBO companies. Resistance grew from the Swazi people. In 2011, a budget crisis saw government struggling to pay the salaries of public sector workers. Swaziland asked South Africa for a loan, but rejected the conditions which required economic and political reforms. The king brought in Judge Michael Ramudibedi from Lesotho as a new Chief Justice. Suddenly, people seeking redress from injustices by the king or his officials had no access to the courts. Swazi lawyers went on strike for more than three months. But in 2013, Ramudibedi was still in place. So then the king acquired shares in the South African mobile phone company, MTN, and gave them a state monopoly. Swazi Telecom was forced to switch off mobile phones. State security would still be able to eavesdrop on phone calls and the king could make more money. Educational standards fell. Banga Gilaba, Labete Batalbab. It's about 70% of them do not have parents. This is what we are talking about when we say the situation in the country is not sustainable. We are talking about a country where the Minister for Finance has said that 40 million per month is lost through corruption. The teacher strike started in June and lasted for seven weeks. The protest was brutally stopped and the teachers dismissed. Swaziland is going for national elections later this year. We have called these actually selections, not elections because they do not conform to the United Nations Charter on Human Rights. Though Swaziland has signed the regional SADC agreement to hold democratic elections, it breaks them every time. The king appoints the prime minister and the cabinet, and through them controls government and legislature. He appoints and dismisses judges. He controls the land through loyal chiefs, he owns the media and telecoms. He is head of the armed forces and controls the police and prison services. He is sole trustee of Tibio and controls all foreign investment. He is immune to the law. Swaziland's budgets and laws could be changed to help the many rather than the few. But only if the system of governance is changed and political parties legalized. there is change. Both Tibio and Dinkundla are increasingly coming into question and resistance continually evolves. seek for a constitutional multi-party democracy that is deepened within the wishes of the majority and the people of Swaziland. 
What can make the king change is mass mobilization of sources. Because culture dictates that the king is a king because of the people. You go to the rural areas, people demanding change from every corner. It is the only tool that can make him change. The tool of imparting information. So what's your views on the story? Should South Africans use their freedom to push for democracy in Swaziland? Now you can share your views on one of three ways via Facebook, Twitter or you can email us. And that's it for tonight. Join us again next week when we point out the issues that matter. <laughs>